Good morning. I'm Charles Osgood, and this is Sunday Morning. I know it sounds strange to me, too, but here we are. Charles Kuralt is alive and well and home watching in his bathrobe, presumably, as he said he would be. Good morning to you, Charles. Now then, the first order of business, if I have this right, is the best medicine. Terrence Smith will report our cover story this morning. Along with all the anxiety and turmoil provoked by the national debate over health care reform, there is some good news. There are changes already underway that promise improvement in the one area that all the reform plans call for, expanded primary and preventive care. This Sunday morning, we'll meet some of the people here in North Carolina and elsewhere who are making and benefiting from those changes. If you are wearing your bedroom slippers at this moment, you may want to go get something more substantial to put on your feet. Toe tapping is much more satisfying with shoes on. Rhythm and blues later this morning as Randall Pinkston takes us to meet Curtis Mayfield. Even after a calamitous accident, that great musician still is playing for keeps. A stroke of luck is a story of heartbreak on the green. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Donald. Mike Donald has tasted success on the professional golf tour. In golf, there's a little bit of luck involved. It doesn't only have to do with what you shoot. It has to do with what the other guys do. And, and what it really comes down to is, in the history book, who gets the trophy? Uh, Mike Donald came within a quarter of an inch of winning the U.S. Open, the biggest prize of all. Since then, the game has become a mystery to him. You know, anybody who plays golf knows how that is. I mean, the, the amateurs, you know, go through that every week, and, you know, the pros go through it, too. Martha Teichner has an extraordinary story to tell us this morning of some wartime heroes on skis. The last name of one of those heroes Martha Teichner will tell us about was Teichner. A postcard from Maine from Tim Sample. A television review from John Leonard. We'll plead with Ray Brady later this morning to help us make sense, if he can, of the wild ups and downs of the stock market. A look at the weather and at sports and a milepost by which to remember the week after the headlines for Sunday morning, the 10th of April. A ceasefire seems to be in effect in Rwanda this morning, according to an officer of the United Nations who says that apart from some sporadic gunfire, the Rwandan army and rebel troops are not firing at each other for the moment. Three days of ethnic fighting in that small Central African country have left the streets of the capital city of Kigali littered with corpses. It may be that as many as 8,000 people have been killed in Kigali alone. A report in today's Washington Post says that although Hillary Rodham Clinton made her own decisions when she was trading commodities, it was James Blair, a lawyer friend of Mrs. Clinton's, who actually relayed those decisions to the broker making the trades. If so, that would be something of an irregularity since brokers are supposed to take orders only from their clients in such cases. Astronauts aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavour have their radar map making gear working this morning after some trouble yesterday. They are making images today of China, Australia, and the Austrian Alps. If you are in one of those places, look up and say cheese. The most interesting thing to happen in baseball yesterday happened not on a diamond, but at an auction house in New York. The bat that Babe Ruth used to hit his 56th home run in 1921 was sold for $63,000. Pretty good for so early in the auction season. All right, you duffers may either want to close your eyes at this point, or you may want to pull your chairs closer to the screen, depending on how you feel about eating your hearts out. In increasing eat your heart out order, here are the three prettiest shots of yesterday's penultimate Masters round in Augusta. Larry Mize on the 12th hole. Eat your hearts out. Larry Mize is three back at five under. Here is Jose Maria Olothabal on the 10th hole. Jose Maria Olothabal, his golf swing looking oh so good. As is this golf shot, whoa. Eat your hearts out. Olothabal is two back at six under. Big. And here is Tom Lehman on the 16th. Lehman able to get the ball to make a right turn at the right time. Tom Lehman, today's leader at seven under. Just keep telling yourself it's spring out there in the southern and central Rockies. You will have to tell yourself it's spring more than a few times today. 
Temperatures in that part of the country will range from the 30s at the bullseye of a pocket of very cold air to the 40s and 50s as you move outward in roughly concentric rings. Cool, too, from the northern plains all the way to the coast of New England. You will not have to convince yourself it's spring anywhere in the southern tier today, though. The thermometer will do that for you. As far as today's weather is concerned, just keep telling yourself it's not winter anymore. Snow is falling in the Rockies. Something between four and seven inches will have fallen by tonight, and there will be more snow there tomorrow. In Kansas, where hail and high winds made for a nasty day yesterday, there will be thunderstorms today. And then the country will be wearing a kind of cummerbund of rain today from the Ohio Valley into the Northeast. It will be bright and sunny, though, up and down the West Coast and in the upper Midwest and Great Lakes. You can tell yourself it's spring tomorrow, too, if you are good at deadpan lying. It will be an ugly day, I'm afraid, across the southern and central plains. Cold, dry air mixing with warm, wet air will cause severe thunderstorms in those parts. That is tornado weather, remember, so be on the lookout. More snow in the Rockies, as we said, and snow possible, too, in eastern Colorado and western Kansas. Soaking rain for the mid-Mississippi and Ohio valleys and showers and thunderstorms likely all across the south. Just keep telling yourself it's spring. If he were here, Charles Corralt might very well be proposing at this point that we remember last week as the week the great jurist, Harry Blackman, announced his retirement from the Supreme Court. And that is a milepost, to be sure. But Charles Corralt isn't here to propose it. He announced his retirement last week, too. I won't lie to you. Whenever around here we look back at the week of the 3rd of April, 1994, we won't be thinking first and foremost of Harry Blackman, I'm afraid. Except for a week or two here and there when Charles was on vacation, this broadcast never has had another host in all its 15 years on the air. Sunday morning was made to measure for Charles Corralt of the finest materials, and it fit him perfectly. If it seems a little tight in some places, a little baggy in others on the fellow wearing it now, I promise you I'd treasure it anyway as the most wonderful hand-me-down there ever was. As for Charles Corralt, this is a chance for me to say behind his back what he never would have allowed me to say to his face. Seeing praise coming, he would have raised an eyebrow and lowered his head, and something almost stern would have come into that kind face to send a message, don't, this is not seemly. Well, seemly or not, I'm going to say it. Charles Corralt is one of no more than two or three people at the very most ever to have used the tools of journalism to make literature on television. To watch what he did for 15 years here on Sunday morning and for 37 years at CBS News is to be reminded that Walt Whitman began as a journalist too, and Mark Twain. Oh, one more thing, if you're worrying about what else may happen around here, don't. You are looking at the only major change Sunday morning has in mind. Once upon a time, doctors made house calls. You may be too young to remember that. Once upon a time, and even I am too young to remember this, people other than doctors provided medical care to those who lived many days' ride from the nearest physician. Well, guess what? Some of the newest ideas in health care are old ideas. The best medicine is our cover story this morning. It is reported now by Terrence Smith. Bill and Hillary Clinton were in full campaign mode this past week, crisscrossing the country on behalf of the administration's number one priority, health care reform. If it's good enough for the Congress and the President, it should be good enough for every single American, and I want to guarantee that. I don't think we need to recheck an EKG. So far, the debate over that reform has produced mostly confusion and apprehension. But the news is not all bad. While Washington argues significant changes are underway around the country that are extending primary health care to some of the people who need it the most. Have you been taking your medication? Believe it or not, doctors are making house calls again. I need to listen to him heart and lungs, okay? Thank you. It's been more than a generation since most doctors gave up making house calls. Instead, they saw patients, one after the other, at their offices or at hospitals with all the latest technology at hand. Can you stick your tongue out? A lot of physicians don't want to do house calls. It's time consuming. Physicians are work working more and more hours. Why should they spend the time? But now, physicians like Dr. Karen Babas, a Chicago family practitioner, are out making them again, 
thanks in part to sharp increases in the fees Medicare pays for house calls to the nation's growing population of elderly. Can you lift up your arm all the way? I think it's really worthwhile. It is continuity of care. You get out and you can watch your patient go from hospital to home and take care of them. And uh, it's an excellent service. I think the word is getting out. We know Dr. Joanne Schwartzberg of the American Medical Association has surveyed the trend. 50% of all primary care physicians do make house calls. They make an average of one or two a month. They don't tell anybody about it. They see the patients that they've known for a long time uh, who cannot get out of the house anymore. Feel that in your knee? That's arthritis. Whatever comes with health care reform, we are moving out of the hospital to office and home, to home and community-based care altogether. How far up can you lift your leg? Dr. Babas, along with nurse practitioner Jerry Ann Gallagher, makes regularly scheduled home visits to patients like Marie Villamick, who is coping with the different ailments that come with her 82 years. I can't get around by myself anymore. I used to do everything. Um, it's going to be 20 years that I lost my husband, and I'm by myself all those years. You know, and you get tired of it. Dr. Babis and Nurse Gallagher say they learn far more about a patient at home than they would from an office visit. Not all the problems are purely medical. Pretty soon I won't be able to afford it, and I don't know where I'm going to go then. Well, you own this house, don't yeah. you? What we can do is we always can do a reverse mortgage. You know what that is? A reverse mortgage takes what the price you have in your house uh -huh. and gives you the money. Okay, so don't you, you're not in financial trouble yet, okay? Well, this isn't a needle, this is just a little finger thing, okay? Thanks to miniaturization, the doctor's traditional black bag now contains many of modern medicine's technological wonders. Dr. Babis believes that the house calls can even save money. Yeah. 93.94. We did uh, oxygen determination today at home. We can do EKGs. Uh, any amount of blood work, lab work, uh, chest x-ray. It's a lot cheaper to keep a person at home and do the test than transport the person to the hospital and spend hospital days doing it. Hi, we're looking for some Mrs. Sykes. Say, ah. Oh. Another way to save money, common to all the proposed health care reform plans, is to make better use of existing medical resources. A case in point, the nation's 100,000 nurse practitioners. Here in North Carolina, independent nurse practitioners have set up their own clinics like this one, where they see patients, write prescriptions, and deal with a wide variety of primary health care problems. Uh, two things, we want Stalaxin, give her 60. Bonnie Hill, a former staff nurse in a doctor's office, went to graduate school to get advanced training as a family nurse practitioner. In three years, she's built a practice of 4,300 patients. I'm just going to just poke around here just a little bit. We deal with ear infections. We deal with upper respiratory infections. Uh, we deal with uh, problems relating to the, the female reproductive system, though we don't deliver babies here. Um, we deal with uh, arthritis. Um, we do a lot of patient education on diabetes, hypertension. Bonnie Hill believes she provides a unique service. The nursing perspective does come through in all of my work. I believe in spending time with the patient. I believe in patient education. I believe that there is no stupid question about their health care. And that's very important to patients. You cannot generically substitute a nurse practitioner for a physician because our training is different, our education is different. Dr. Palma Formica, a New Jersey physician, is a board member of the American Medical Association, which is staunchly opposed to an expanded independent role for nurse practitioners. I'm concerned about the quality of care. What if that one case of the flu turns out to be a Ray's syndrome that needs the immediate emergency care? Is she capable of referring that patient immediately for the kind of care they need? See, throw. 
I think nurses know what it is that they don't know and know what it is that is not nursing or know what it is that is not primary care. Virginia Betts is president of the American Nurses Association, which argues that advanced practice nurses could handle as much as 80 percent of the cases that come through a doctor's office at 40 percent less cost. And I certainly hope that the AMA will begin to listen to what consumers say and know that there really is enough health care services to go around that we can all share without them feeling that they have to uh, really carry on a vindictive, uh, fear-mongering turf battle about nurses. I have a lady whose sugar just keeps bouncing up and down, and I may need to get you to see her. We've tried all Bonnie that. offers another avenue. She Modalities takes care of just about anybody that comes through the door if they need to be, uh, if they're referred. Okay, what have you done as far as changing that part of it? Dr. Carvel Tolson works with Bonnie Hill as her supervising physician, as required by law in most states. He reviews her charts on a regular basis. She's very thorough, in as far as I can tell and as far as I'm concerned, in following up on any problems that might develop. I think that it's a matter of looking at each case uh, separately and deciding what uh, education levels really do work best, as opposed to just say, you know, close my mind, I don't like that idea, you know, because it invades my turf for whatever reason it may be. Okay. All right, Leo. We'll see so, you again. I'll come back and visit you in about a month or two, okay? Back in Chicago, nurse practitioner Jerry Ann Gallagher has begun making house calls on her own without Dr. Babas. There's a lot of things I can do independently, which I'd like to see supported by the AMA, um, that enhance my practice and enhance Dr. Babas's practice. I feel that. If we work collaboratively, we can enhance each other's role, provide more effective, more cost-saving care. While it's impossible to predict just what will finally emerge from health care reform, Jerry Ann Gallagher, Dr. Karen Babas, and Bonnie Hill all are on the cutting edge of changes in health care that are already well underway. Gee, that's real good. It's Sunday morning on CBS, and here again is Charles Osgood. And next we have the story that asks the question, can a masterpiece of a book be made into a masterpiece of a television series on Masterpiece Theater? And here's John Leonard to talk to us about it. Good morning, John. Good morning, Charles. At the greatest of English novels, Middlemarch, the BBC has thrown a lot of money, $10 million. The six-part Masterpiece Theater starting tonight on public television is a handsome, almost voluptuous production. Andrew Davies, who wrote Mother Love, adapts George Eliot's compendium of 19th century anxieties about social status and spiritual being with a refreshing comic emphasis. Anthony Page directs with a flair for furniture and vistas. As in all the best British dramas, the actors seem to have read the whole book, not just their own parts. As in the novel, so alas on television, Dorothea, who aspires to make life beautiful for everybody, marries the wrong man. And Dr. Lydgate, who wants to save the world from disease and superstition, marries the wrong woman. Nor will they find each other after so much bad luck, blind pride, sexual dysfunction, hypocritical vindictiveness, and sudden death. George Eliot was not a softy. What news have you brought, Uncle? News? News about... Tonight, in the ravishing person of Juliet Aubrey, We'll meet Dodo, like as her sister calls her, sure designing farm workers' good. cottages that her ridiculous I'm Uncle Arthur, played by Robert not. Hardy, will never pay for. Well, so be it. I feel I understand you. And Dodo will meet Casabon, Patrick Malahide's gloomy and neurotic clergyman, who will never write his synthesizing key to world mythologies. No. To the but in these cases, there's nothing to be done. But and Lydgate, played by Douglas Hodge, begins his brand new medical practice by compromising his ethics with a vote on a hospital matter and compromising his affections with the upwardly mobile spendthrift Rosamond, played by Trevin McDowell.
We take our leave tonight of Dodo in Rome, where the art's sublime and the marriage isn't. Edward, I wish you did not feel that I need diversions. For God's sake, say so! Between now and next month, lots will happen, not much of it pleasant, before Lydgate leaves town in financial ruin. That all my great works... And Bullstraw, the banker with an awful secret, is blackmailed to the point of murdering a regrettable Raffles. Why do you not die? And Dodo gives up her inheritance to run off with Will, who thinks he's an artist. And you'll go away among queer people and, and live in a street. And I shall never see you. In Middlemarch, the moral weather is damp and iffy. Morning, ma'am. Morning. Looks like a fine one. Yes. Yes, it does. I have my gripes. You always do when they mess with a masterpiece. George Eliot, who had pinned down Darwin and the French philosophers, who had published essays on everybody from Goethe to Harriet Beecher Stowe, who had translated Spinoza, and who used to chat in Greek, knew everything there was to know in the 19th century. And most of it doesn't show up on television, because television omits the novelist's web of ironic metaphors in favor of love gone wrong. Nor is an American audience likely to grasp what reform was all about in Eliot's England, of bread riots and collective bargaining by insurrection, of workhouses, penal colonies, and satanic mills, where a man could be hanged for poaching a rabbit and a woman for stealing a shilling's worth of shoes. On the other hand, if a televised Middlemarch sells half as many copies of the novel here as it did in England, we should rejoice. Staying home with George is a whole lot healthier than going out to the movies to see what they've done to poor Isabel Allende. Now, playing for keeps. This is a story of joy and also of grief. The joy is provided by the music and the spirit of Curtis Mayfield. Fate provided the grief. But you will not find those two strains in equal parts in the profile Randall Pinkston is about to offer, because where there has been so much joy, grief, however great, can never win the day. He's a, he's a great poet to me. His music uh, reached up to me in Canada when I was a kid and touched me very deeply. He, he addressed uh, situations in the 70s that people weren't talking about until he talked about it. The anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, the black power movement, but Curtis tried to bring people together, tried to unite people with his music. There have been only 12 Living Legend Awards given during the 35-year history of the Grammys. It's a tribute from recording artists to one of their own. Here with his lifelong friends, Jerry Butler and the Impressions, please welcome Curtis Mayfield. After more than three decades of making music, it's Curtis Mayfield's first Grammy Award. Thank you very much. Curtis, on behalf of all the musicians gathered here on stage and in the audience, we want to thank you for the lasting soul and the deep beauty of the music that you made. Um, you've been an inspiration to all of us, and we're just honored to be up here with you tonight and uh, glad to present you with the Grammy Legend Award. We love you. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. And to the many artists who, through the years, have performed my song. Now maybe someday. What's special about Curtis Mayfield is his ability to write music that captures the spirit of the times. I know I can make it with just a little bit of soul. Let me ask you about Keep On Pushing. How did you come up with that? Well, Keep On Pushing actually started as a gospel song. The only difference 
and the lyrical change was uh, I originally written it saying God gave me my strength for the commercial value I said I've got my strength and it don't make sense not to keep on pushing Of course, this was during the Aryan time, people of minority and we as black people trying to achieve equality here in America. With the Impressions during the 60s, his combination of gospel and blues defined the Chicago sound. Did you encounter any difficulty from the record companies with your effort to retain control and ownership of your work? I certainly did. The big companies and presidents weren't used to a young kid coming in at 16, 17 saying he owned his own publishing and he was to deal with them accordingly. And the songs were recorded and thank God they were hits. Does it surprise you that the music that you wrote 30 years ago still has so much meaning to people today? Well, really it doesn't. I always looked upon my music and my writings like good conversation. If you relate from the heart, we all have the same fears. We shed similar tears. We die in so many years. Uh, all about the world, uh, that don't change amongst people. In the 70s, Mayfield left the Impressions and struck out on his own. He composed and performed the soundtrack for the controversial movie Superfly, which allowed him to write about another side of his life. It was very easy for me to write about Superfly and all the uh, drugs and things of that sort. I come from Chicago. Um, I went to nine grammar schools as a kid before I even got to the first high school. What was it like? It was poor, it was poverty, it was welfare, it was all of those things. However, the crime then wasn't like the crime today. The life experiences that Mayfield calls food for thought continued to inspire his music. Long after his songs were no longer on the charts, Mayfield continued to write and perform all over the world until a fateful day in Brooklyn, New York in August 1990. What do you remember? Not much. <laughs> My opening number was Superfly. I was introduced. I walked up the backstage with my guitar, ready to perform. Took about three steps toward the front, and I guess the lights went out. I never saw anything coming. I never felt anything. But after, I suppose, opening my eyes uh, to recognize that my hands and my feet were not where I thought they were, to try and lift myself up to, to realize that I was paralyzed. For the past four years, Mayfield has been bound to his wheelchair. After several surgical procedures, he is still a quadriplegic, unable to pick up his guitar and barely able to sing. It was very hard for me to build out a tune 
uh, not having a diaphragm, uh, being quite weak in the lungs, and sitting in this position. Do you still hear music in your, in your mind, yes? Oh yeah, we've, during our conversation, we've probably written a few songs. Before your accident, you would get up and get your guitar and track them, yes. record them. Now how do you keep those songs? I don't. At the moment, I haven't really written a song uh, since my accident. Yes. Ooh, yeah. Number two says, honoring your outstanding contributions to and influence in music and recording. But slowly, Mayfield is returning to the business to which he devoted his life. Recently, he went back to his studio to record one of his old songs for a new CD, All Men Are Brothers. It was a great challenge which allowed me to uh, sing the middle part of a song known as Let's Do It Again. And I actually got through it in about three takes. And uh, it sounds pretty good. Do you want to do it again? Yeah. Sing? Yes. Cause I've got my strength and it don't make sense not to keep on pushing. All little girls see their fathers as heroes, of course. Martha Teichner's actually was. My German refugee father, Hans Peppi Teichner. I was nine when he died. I knew that skiing was his profession, his passion, but the mystery of old photographs in a drawer, his life as a skiing soldier was what fascinated me. The packs really did weigh 90 pounds, and the song became the theme of the 10th Mountain Division. Never before had there been an American Army unit like it. Our mountain divisions are being trained for the vital role they will play in the destruction of the Axis. Close to 15,000 volunteers brought together at Camp Hale, Colorado, by their love of skiing in the mountains, like Steve Knowlton, straight out of prep school. Skiing, you see, had just started in the United States, and the people that skied in the 30s were obviously wealthy people. Not quite everybody. In my platoon, uh, we had a horse thief, we had an Indian chief, uh, we had college kids, we had a forest ranger. But when Bob Parker got to Colorado for training, he couldn't believe it. The instructors were the most famous, glamorous skiers in the world, European racers such as Friedel Pfeiffer, who, like my father, had escaped the Nazis and had been teaching movie stars to ski at Sun Valley. I felt much more like it was a club than a, a military outfit. <laughs> we just didn't act like we're going to kill somebody, which we're taught to do, you know. We just uh, forgot it and we kept on uh, being friends. And then there were the mules, 2,000 of them, who did not volunteer and were reputedly all mean. A reminder that this was no skiing holiday. At more than 9,000 feet elevation, the physical training was brutal. We used to dig holes in the snow. Mac McKenzie remembers only too well. Cut boughs, throw those into the hole. Then our sleeping bags would go in the hole. Then we would get undressed, crawling that sleeping bag when it was, what, minus 30 below zero, 30 below at least zero wind, wind chill anyway. And every morning we'd wake up and you'd have to shake the snow because you might have a foot of new snow, new powder snow that had accumulated overnight. And we used to hate to crawl out of that bag in the morning, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. Put on frozen boots. But it was nearly spring when the 10th finally went to war in February 1945. They found themselves in Italy, 
at the bottom of a mountain with the German line at the top. Two attempts were made before, and, and they couldn't get the Germans out of there. They were, they were dug in like a groundhog. So we were the third one to go in there and, and shake him loose, which we did. The overwhelming images were connected with the machine gun fire and artillery fire that was hitting us at night. And it was my first hour of combat. They broke through and kept going, marching, not skiing, through the Po River Valley being picked off by the Germans' deadly, desperate last stand. 992 men died. 4,000 were injured in less than three months. The only color I saw was red. But during my entire combat experience, I never really saw any color. I just saw this, it was my mindset. The gray, the brown, the black the white and the red. Why? What was it? I guess the fear. Nuke Eldridge was hit April 14th. So was Senator Bob Dole, who'd only just been assigned to the 10th. And they were sort of looking down our throats. And, uh, but, you know, as we move forward, they move backward. And it turned into almost a rout. Of and then the war in Italy was over. As a tribute, the defeated German general asked to be escorted to his surrender by General George Hayes, commander of the 10th Mountain Division. The spectacular things you have done. It is the good, the companionship, the fun we had together, the great ski adventures. That, 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 that's what's important in our lives. The horror was set aside. For Earl Clark and most of the men of the 10th, that meant one thing skiing. My feeling was if I make it through the war, I want to try to make an Olympic team. That was my first objective. Steve Knowlton skied in the 1948 Olympics. I decided in a very early age that I wanted to build a ski area. I didn't know where or how. Pete Seibert eventually built Vail, the world's largest ski resort. Friedel Pfeiffer saw Aspen for the first time on a 10th mountain training patrol. And I looked across the valley, and I saw something that I grew up with, a mountain made by God for skiing. The ski school he started there was like a magnet for veterans of the 10th, including my father. The first thing I remember that he approached me was a big smile on his face. And I want this sign, please, Freedom. Thanks to you, my boys are loving ski racing. Well, and that's we really great. appreciate all the work that you're doing. Now, nearly half a century later, hundreds of those men, still skiing in their 70s and 80s, can look back with nostalgia and take credit for skiing as it exists today in America. Camp Hale is gone now, but the slopes where men of the 10th did their training are still here. And every March for the last 19 years, a group of veterans has come back to where it all began, not just to recall their war stories, but to ski together. And to renew the bond they share with their past. So we've come home to Mountain Peace, to men in hills we loved before. Even this rite of remembrance is a celebration of skiing. Sing a 90 pounds of rock, sack a pound of grub or two. We have old men among us, but uh, uh, the mountains are a fountain of youth. And if you keep coming back to it, why, uh, you can go on skiing until the day you drop. Sack a pound of grub or two, and he'll shush the mountains like his daddy used to do.
A new wind is rising, bringing change, bringing the all-new Ford Windstar, a totally new minivan. Windstar is the only minivan that combines standard dual airbags, five-mile-an-hour bumpers, and four-wheel anti-lock brakes. Plus, it meets all passenger car safety standards. It's safety that takes the minivan in a whole new direction. The all-new front-wheel drive Ford Windstar. The future of minivans begins today. If you'd like your organization to become more adept at handling change, Anderson Consulting can help you integrate all the parts. Because these days, the organization that performs together transforms together. Do you have fresh fruit salad, yogurt? Okay, what vegetables do you have? French fried, home fried, and mash. Do you have anything that's good for me? I got Tums. If I don't eat your food, I don't need the Tums. But you do. Tums has calcium. Do these? No. They have aluminum and magnesium. Of these, only Tums helps knock out heartburn. Ow! And gives you calcium. It's something my body needs anyway. What the heck? Give me the burger with everything, including the Tums. Calcium rich Tums. It's Sunday morning on CBS, and here again is Charles Osgood. And speaking of skiing, the stock market took a downhill course that was a little too fast for a lot of people at uh, the beginning of this week, and then took some slalom-like twists and turns. And Ray Brady is here with us this morning to help explain it. Ray? Good morning, Charles. It kind of broke a leg on that downhill slide. <laughs> I'm afraid. Ray, there's something I don't understand about this, and that is, why is it that the stock market nowadays seems to react exactly the opposite of what you would think. Now, I can remember when, when there was good news, the stock market went up. When there was bad news, it went down. But didn't this, uh, this tumble take place right after the announcement that uh, public confidence had reached a, a much higher level than it's been in recent years? Yeah, it took place right after there was a lot of good news, especially on unemployment, that jobs were being created, a lot more jobs than anybody had expected. So you say to yourself, what happens? Here's good news, the market goes down. Actually, the market always looks forward. What's going to happen next? When they saw all this good news, they started worrying about interest rates going up. Now, when interest rates go up, stocks almost invariably go down. And you may recall the Federal Reserve had raised interest rates a few weeks ago. Um, a lot of people have speculated in Wall Street with borrowed money. When interest rates go up, they have to pay more to carry all these loans. And that is one of the big reasons that the market went down. So they're trying to think one or two steps ahead. Yeah, and they're saying, look, if I've got to pay more money to carry these bonds and these stocks, uh, what's going to happen. Also, bond prices go down when interest rates go up. It's a little hard to follow, but that's what happens. And a lot of these people had speculated in bonds as well. We're talking about the professionals on Wall Street. And what had happened was they were getting hit two ways. The interest rate to carry those bonds, that was going up. The bond prices were going down. They dumped. And when they dumped, a lot of investors in stocks dumped as well. Now, is this trying to anticipate moves on the part of uh, Alan Greenspan and the rest of the Federal Reserve Board? Yeah, the expectation on Wall Street is that when the Federal Reserve meets again on May 17th, it'll raise interest rates again, and when it meets again in the summer, it will raise interest rates. Why is it raising interest rates? Because it's trying to keep inflation from coming back. You know, the economy is heating up so much, much more than any of the economists anticipated, that the Fed is a little bit worried about things getting out of hand. But isn't that good when the economy turns around? I mean, we're, we're all hoping for a long time that you'd, you'd had such a stagnant economy for a long time, and finally you say, well, isn't this nice now? We see a little light at the end of the tunnel, things are looking up. You don't want to do anything to step on that. That's right. I mean, actually, we're following a very, very sensible course in the economy. But this is one of the points, one of the times when the stock market has kind of diverged from the economy. And you have to remember that there are two things that drive these big investors on Wall Street, fear and greed. <laughs> uh, greed, when the market goes up, everybody wants to make more and more. When it hits a period like this, fear sets in. People panic and they dump. And that's what we've, we're seeing now. So those two fine noble emotions are what, uh, what drives all of this. By the way, speaking of Alan Greenspan, is it just him? I mean, is, it, is this something, can he decide one day? I think I'll raise interest rates today. 
or is it a little more complicated? Than well, that? it's a little more complicated than that, but he's been called the second most powerful man in the country because of the ability to uh, raise or lower interest rates. The uh, Fed operates absolutely independent of the White House. You may say to yourself, why should this be so? Why should the Federal Reserve have so much power? The reason is that the fear is that if politicians could control it, on election year, you would see money pouring into the economy, and the next year would have a big bust because the man in the White House got elected. But at some point here, he's up for reappointment, right? I mean, at, at some point, he has to either be reappointed or not reappointed by, by the president. So, so down the line, anyway, he can't make the president too unhappy. That's right. And, you know, they say in an election year, usually it's a very good year for the economy. And the uh, cynics all say that's because the Federal Reserve can read the newspapers, too. So there is a little give there, no matter, even though they would never admit it. Now, what is the relationship between the market and the economy? I mean, it seemed to me that, the, that during that time that the economy was rather, was rather poor, the stock market was doing rather well. It was, it was in a constant uh, upward motion. That, that's right, because the, the stock market said to itself, look, things are terrible now, um, but they're going to get better, so we buy stocks now. The, the mistake that the public makes when they go into the stock market is they wait until they read about it in the newspapers that it's up or they see it on television. The time to buy is when it's down in the dumps, and that's when, that's when you make your money. But it's very hard to do that. But I've heard that it's not just the public, the individual little investor that's, that's been driving all this, but rather the, the people who are managing these big funds and that sort of thing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, the big money that's been lost now has been by the professionals. There's one fellow has lost $1 billion of investors' money. I mean, these are uh, they're called hedge funds. And big investors put their money in with these people. These guys have been taking all kinds of chances. They've been playing foreign markets, Hong Kong, you name it. They borrowed money, they loaded up, and these are the people who are really getting hit the hardest. Is, is it still scary at this point? The market recovered a little bit on Thursday, went down a little bit some more on, uh, on, on Friday. But uh, can we just look back on last week and say this is, this is just an isolated bad week? Or is there, is there tricky uh, thin yeah. ice up ahead here? I'm, I'm afraid, Charles, you know, uh, one day last week the market shot right up. On Wall Street, this is known as a dead cat bounce, <laughs> which means that if you drop a dead cat from high enough, it will bounce. Well, if the stock market comes down as much as it did, it'll give a bounce. So this is why nobody trusts it right now. It's the dead cat bounce theory. Uh, the feeling is that there is more to come in this. Now, it may not come next week. They will be watching. There are two figures coming out next week on pr producer prices, consumer prices. If these are up, the market could tank again. If they're okay, things will go steady. But most people on Wall Street feel there's a little bit more to come. Well, we'll all stay tuned and see what happens uh, on Wall Street. Ray Brady, thank you so much for coming in and talking with us this morning. Thank you. This is a good time of year to go out and get some exercise. And up there in the pine tree state, that is exactly what folks have been doing. But they're not exercising their arms and legs. What they're exercising is their vocal cords and their ancient right to be heard. A postcard from Maine now, from Tim Sample. Let's face it, folks, it's been a wicked long winter. Sub-zero temperatures, eight-foot snowdrifts, and an epidemic of cabin fever. Around this time of year, we Mainers start looking out for signs of spring. I've already seen a few. They're raising a bumper crop of frost heaves on the roads around here. The ice is finally breaking up on rivers and streams and sap is rising in the sugar maples. But there's nothing that signifies spring to me more than town meeting day. People Basically look forward the, to it. Yes, they do. They do. They look forward to getting up, hearing what's going on, <coughs> seeing other people. Yeah. Try to wipe the cabin fever out. You can get up there and yell like hell. <laughs> yeah. Bob and Roberta Chase are hard at work making maple syrup this time of year, but that won't keep them from town meeting. Yep, we've got to be there. See what's going on. If you don't go, you don't know. Rights. 
You know, it's hard to make a living, especially raising kids. Well, yeah. one. <laughs> so when it comes down meeting time, you're concerned about where your dollar's going. That's right. That's right. And lots of dollars go there. You know, we have a right to have a say where they go and what they're doing with them. One hot item this year is the question of replacing the aging fire truck. They want to buy a new chrome truck for out in the country. You don't need chrome to fight a fire. We don't have That's any right. people to sit there and polish chrome all day. They don't work any better with the chrome. We've had town meeting around here since colonial times. But don't let that fool you. This is not some antique concept or boring tradition. Nope, after stewing indoors all winter, the good people of Whitefield are primed to exercise their constitutional rights and their jaw muscles. If everything goes through today, my taxes are going to go up $500. Austin Morris is going to go over, go up over $600. This is hard money to find. What I'm looking at is the difference between one mile of road and one teacher for the school, and I go for the teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This might seem like a quaint scene out of a Norman Rockwell painting, but it's important to remember that in many places around the world, you'd be risking your life to speak out like this. And folks in Whitefield are definitely not shy about speaking out. What Mr. Oba just said should tell us all something. The budget doesn't let us come out to supper as much as we used to, maybe. Is there a motion on Article 23? As predicted, the fire truck issue sparked some fireworks. I, I don't take too much time here, but the truck that we have sitting over on our stations in 1965, there's a 30-year-old truck down in Kings Mills, and your next newest truck is 20 years old sitting in North Whitefield. And at some point, you're going to have to replace them. So we're just tr we're trying to plan here, and if you can't help us, well, you know, maybe we'll get tired of doing it. Maybe somebody else will have to do it. We don't need threats like that. Please, please, let's keep the meeting order. It's not a threat, Phil. You're, you've retired. We've all earned it. I've been doing it 20 years. Maybe I need to retire. We've had volunteer fire departments in this town for a good many years, and we don't need somebody standing up here threatening us that they're going to get done if we don't support their cause. Bob Chase of Kings Mills. These fire trucks that we have down there in Kings Mills and in North Whitefield and Cooper Smells, I think they're all right. And they all want these new fire trucks with a lot of chrome on them so they can sit back in the fire department and polish them up. I think we can go with a good used truck. That's all I got. All those in favor of raising zero dollars for the fire truck replacement fund, please raise your hands. Town meeting isn't over until every item on the town warrant has been debated and retired. Whether things went their way or not, folks have the satisfaction of knowing that they've said their piece. I had my chance to say my say. They, the people didn't buy it, that's all. You have to wait and try it again. Everyone should have their, their day in court, as it said. Day in school, day at town meeting. Those opposed to reconsidering People have always wanted to express their opinion. Back to the pilgrims, they probably wanted to express their opinion, have their voice be heard. We haven't changed. Attending a town meeting like this one here in Whitefield, Maine, makes me wonder whether democracy itself wasn't born out of our harsh New England climate. Perhaps merely surviving another winter gave our forebears the courage to resist a different kind of tyranny. Now, mostly, town meeting boils along just like that maple sugar pot, with some of the same sweet results. Pure, homemade democracy. A stroke of luck is often what golf comes down to in the end. They'll all tell you that, all the great players gathered down there in Augusta, Georgia today for the final round of the Masters tournament. One of them will win the Masters this afternoon, after four rounds of 18 holes each, after thousands of yards, after hundreds of strokes. One bit of fortune or misfortune can win or lose the title. 
For this is a game where luck finds you, then suddenly leaves you quicker than you can say, Mike Donald. To see Mike Donald and Hale Irwin on the practice tee, you'd think they were just a couple of Sunday golf buddies out hitting a bucket of balls for fun. It's about a normal Florida breeze. Yeah. Huh? They are friendly enough, these two. Their game built on sportsmanship demands that of them. Have you got a bunch of courses to do? Well, we're getting ready to start up some, yeah. But for them, golf is not just a weekend pastime. It's their lives. They are both professionals. One day, Irwin and Donald were locked in earnest combat playing against each other on television for the U.S. Open Golf Championship. Hale Irwin is one of the game's superstars. In fact, he has won three U.S. Open championships. Mike Donald is a guy who is still trying to earn his way, a striver, like so many others who play this sometimes cruel game. My saying is, hey, it's going to get better and it's going to get worse, you know? Someday you're going to be playing worse and someday you're going to be playing better. You know, anybody who plays golf knows how that is. I mean, the, the amateurs, you know, go through that every week and, you know, the pros go through it too. Mike Donald's attitude is not unusual out here on the Pro Tour. But his story is. This uh, little skinny kid, and I mean skinny, he weighed about 100 pounds, came up with his bag on his shoulder, and his mother brought him in and said, uh, Johnny Lafonzina, a Florida resort owner, area, was a golf why, professional then. We want our son to take lessons, and would you consider helping him? So I, I went out and I said, well, I said the first thing this guy, the kid's got to do is gain some weight. Said, this kid is anemic. Mike was 13 at the time. His mother, Pearl, thought golf might give him some direction in life. They came from a very meager background, and this woman saved her pennies to get my going. I felt so guilty after about the fourth or fifth lesson, I couldn't charge him anymore. I remember my mother, I qualified for the U.S. Amateur one year and uh, out in Los Angeles. And we didn't, my dad said we just didn't have the money to send me. So my mother slipped me the money for the plane fare and told my dad that somebody, you know, the men's golf associate had given me the money, you know. So. Ladies and gentlemen. The pro on the tee from Hollywood, Florida, Mike Donald. And by the time he was 24, Mike Donald had realized Pearl's dream and what was now his obsession, playing professional golf. When I first went on the tour, I was just hoping I'd be able to play two or three years and make a little bit of money and, and maybe be able to stay out on the tour for a little while. To, to, for me to have dreamt, to, you know, what happened to me for the first 10 years of my tour, uh, tour life, you know, I, I mean, I could have never, I could have never even written it down if somebody said draw out the pictures. What happened was that Mike became an intense competitor, a grinder, as he likes to call himself. And in 1989, he won his first tournament. Oh, he's got it. And over $430,000 for the year. The victory made him eligible for golf's major championships. Sports writer Jim Murray wrote, in the little theater of golf, Michael William Donald is the guy who came to town with a straw suitcase and a bus ticket and became a folk hero. I wish I could. Okay. I think on it, See you later. Nathan. My confidence just kept, kept rolling. And it, it, it's weird, it's kind of like a subconscious confidence. It's not something that you say, well, I've got confidence. It's just kind of you walking around with a little bit more bounce in your step. I could tell players treated me different. You know, the top players treated me different. You know, they had a new respect for me. The leader, Mike Donald. At the Masters in Augusta in 1990, with Mother Pearl in attendance, Mike was the leader after the first round. Tied some records, broke some records, almost. In an unusual turn of events, Nick Faldo repeats the British star Nick Faldo won that Masters, but Mike Donald had made another statement. And so had Pearl. Well, after I left the media room, she kind of stayed around and held court with the, with the media, you know, doing her own interview. But, uh, you know, it was a big thrill for her, and she loved golf more than I did. Mike Donald with a one-shot lead. And then it was on to the United States Open, the biggest prize in the game. This shot a little bit lower, should be a little deeper into the green. Just the right distance. That is strong. Win the Open, they say, and you're set for life. I was a little bit nervous, but it wasn't like it wasn't like I'd been at other times. You know, I was playing well, so you know that kind of gave me a sense of, of security. Mike Donald 
needs to make this par putt to win the 1990 United States Open Golf Championship. If he doesn't make it was Monday, June 18th, 1990, an 18 hole playoff matching Mike Donald with two time U.S. Open champion Hale Irwin. Mike needed this putt at the last hole to win. Golf can be the cruelest of games sometimes. The match ended on the very next hole. In golf, there's a little bit of luck involved. It doesn't only have to do with what you shoot. It has to do with what the other guys do. And, and what it really comes down to is, in the history book, who gets the trophy, you know? Who gets the trophy is what matter, and it doesn't really matter how. Lady Luck had deserted him, and Mike's game went into a tailspin. The following year, Pearl died of cancer. Mike lost his anchor and what was left of his confidence. You know, I think that's been part of my problem is I've been so confused, and, I, and I've worked on my mechanics so much that, you know, I've kind of lost a little bit of my feel for playing, you know, and I'm, I'm out beating balls and uh, kind of become a range jockey. For a while, I got so into technique and looking at videos and that uh, I kind of got clogged up in my brain, you know. My brain wouldn't work. He is back at square one, really. No longer automatically eligible to play on the tour. He has to rely on old contacts. How you doing? How about you? You look great. What day is it? It's Friday. Old friends to invite him to events like the recent Honda Classic in Fort Lauderdale, the area Mike Donald grew up in. Every hole is 70 or 80 people. Hi, Mike. How you doing? Remember me from high school? Remember me from grade school? And I was your, I was played little league baseball with you. Thank you. Thank you. Coach Ferrar. Yeah. He's my main man. He's always been a popular pro, especially in his hometown. Thank you very much. Good luck to you. Thanks. Thanks. He's popular with his fellow pros, too. One of them offers him a new club to try. Is this a different shaft? Yeah, all different Just flexes. A different flex. That one's a lot further, isn't it? Yeah. Huh? That's good. Another analyzes his putting stroke. Johnny Lapanzina believes it's only a matter of time. Stroke look good? Yeah. I think the, the, the open, his mom dying, and probably a lot of factors. He's had a, he's had a couple of down, down years, but it's the same, he's got the same ability. He's the same person. He's working just as hard. I do a lot better when I, when I, when I don't think about the US Open being a disappointment. I really do. To win the 1990 United States Open Golf Championship. People dream their whole life. You know, I mean, I sat on putting greens just like everybody else, saying this is going to be for the U.S. Open since I was 13 years old. You know, I played two days in front of all the people. And, uh, you know, that's pretty neat to be able to live your dream. Didn't come out quite right that time. But uh, there can be another chance. Bob Schieffer's guests later this morning on Face the Nation will be Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell and Minority Leader Bob Dole. They'll discuss health care, reform, and the Supreme Court and other issues, too. We leave you this morning in a field in Texas, east of Austin and west of Houston. If those directions aren't exact enough for you, well, keep driving till you see the flowers, then stop and look around.
I'm Charles Osgood. Hope you'll join us here again next Sunday morning. Until then, I'll see you on the radio. Chances grow thinner, but there's no hiding place against the kingdom's throne. You know there's no hiding place. There's no hiding place. So people get ready. There's a train coming. You don't need no baggage. You just get on board. Just thank the Lord. People get ready. People get ready.